Thanks. Well, there'll be several course strolling in. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'll be I'll be doing a Q and A afterwards. Uh, this probably will take another thirty minutes, like the last show, and I'll do my best to <laughs> to answer these questions. Um, the topic I'll be presenting today will be how security will be provided in a free society based on consent. Uh, I find that some of the most uh, dangerous lies uh, permeate uh, permeate out there, like in the, especially in public schools. Uh, especially aside from you know the social contract is a real contract or that government you know exists, uh, is that uh, in regards to when talking about government, they like to also say, well, at least the very least, government exists to protect your life, liberty, and property. And I find that one to be the most uh, dangerous lie to uh, to propagate, <laughs> to put out there, because uh, the truth of the matter is is that it doesn't. Um, many Supreme Court cases have ruled. And uh, Duchenne versus Winnebago County and Warren versus District of Columbia, that the police hold no constitutional duty or obligation to protect you. Right? They have, uh, and in their explanation, they wrote that the court uh, ruled that the duty to provide public services is owed to the public at large and absent a special relationship between the police and an individual. No specific legal duty exists. So, this is something that uh, a lot of actually criminal justice majors don't know about, which is uh, funny because that's where I was studying at VCU. And this is something they really do not uh, inform you of. And of course, which is why a lot of people still believe in the myth that government exists to protect you. Uh, so imagine that, right? You're now being forced uh, at gunpoint to tax taxation to pay for a service in which they do not have to provide. Right. And if someone went to your door uh, soliciting such an offer, soliciting such a contract, uh, you would really uh, readily tell them, you know, to, you know, to, you know, this is a scam. Warn your neighbors, uh, get off my lawn and shut the door behind you. Right. Uh, and that's how you should see it as it is a scam. <laughs> they have uh, no obligation, no duty. So therefore, under their officer's uh, discretion, they could choose at any time whether they want to fulfill that uh, false contract. Uh, that you feel that most people feel that they have with government, right? In terms of the constitution, remember it's not a real contract, and there again exists no factual evidence that a uh, contractual relationship exists with government. Uh, so when we analyze how security would be provided in a free market society based on consent, uh, we first have to look at how it exists today, <laughs> uh, how it's provided today, or lack thereof, of course. And so immediately when people think about uh, without government, they think without police, they think without uh, these monopoly on government services, they think of a world of chaos, uh, then it's, I would say, it's a good, healthy, uh, I guess, sober outlook to have now to look at, this is what chaos kind of looks like, <laughs> right? You don't have that protection. Um, and at the same time, you can also say it's not that bad in that most of the people, most people don't really resort to violence to solving their disputes. I would say for the most part, they're tricked of course, into participating, into uh, a system, the organization of government, and to uh, legitimizing and advocating for that. Um, it's not something I've found to be morally aligned with what they do advocate in their day-to-day -day life, uh, in which they find a plurality of nonviolent solutions to solve their problems. And again, it's kind of like uh, uh, that George Orwell saying that uh, who controls the past controls the future, and who controls the present controls the past, and therefore, which is why you're no will not also hear anything about Lysander Spooner and how mail <laughs> used to be delivered before government monopolized it. So in uh, studying, analyzing the present, you'll find that there exists um, no protection, right? Uh, that, it's, that it's a lie otherwise to, uh, to make the claim. Um, now, what about the military? Uh, you know, some people will say, well, I guess if the police are not there to offer you protection, what about the military? If the military does exist there to defend your freedom, right, then you will see a measure of growth, then I would say, uh, in relation to that, in relation to their mission of uh, safeguarding your freedom, that you would be granted, I guess, have more freedoms, right? But of course, uh, you continue seeing the opposite of that, uh, the de escalation of that. Uh, one step forward, you know, with many people advocating for the legalization of uh, cannabis, but losing so many others in the same amount of time. I wouldn't say that's a measure of success. And so, you know, you can safely, well, I would, I was, again, in the last uh, Fight the Matrix show, I was talking about that I used, used to myself be a former military uh, welfare veteran. 
And so I can tell you that it does nothing to defend or uh, grant you more freedoms. And it's, you know, it's an honest outlook to say that it's failed, right? It's here at home where we're losing our freedom, uh, not overseas, right? Not in places you've never been to, uh, not by strangers you've never met. It's actually by the uh, the very politicians, the very organization here, uh, in which many of those who join the military, I would say, have been distracted and misled in believing that this is a way to kind of protect your home, your your community, by shipping those who have a vested interest in that overseas. Um, so yeah, I, the military does nothing to also protect your freedom. Um, so starting off with that, uh, let's start going over some of the uh, arguments uh, for and against. And uh, I guess which we'll, we'll tie this into uh, being close to Halloween. Uh, some interesting, I guess, uh, uh, well, people will say, well, in the absence of a government monopoly on security, you know, what do you do about warlords? What do you do about serial killers? What do you do about would-be thieves? And the area of, uh, I guess, serial killers, I guess many of us have, have, I guess a lot of the information has kind of been out there that many of them have incurred, I guess, a common denominator of child abuse. Uh, in terms of, uh, let's see who we have here, like Charles Manson, um, there was a lot of neglect. His uh, mother would often tease him about selling him. Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, um, it's interesting about Jeffrey Dahmer because people will say that, you know, he didn't experience any child abuse. His parents were very kind to him. Um, but I found out otherwise, uh, you know, it's very, uh, it's a common myth that most people don't look at a uh, spanking, for example, as child abuse. And Jeffrey Dahmer was also spanked. He was assaulted at uh, the earliest of month of uh, nine months years old. So it's kind of funny how you'll look online and you'll look uh, Google Jeffrey Dahmer and child abuse and you'll find all these claims saying that he was not abused. I and mean, that's mostly because they don't uh, view spanking as child abuse, you know, so that's uh, very easy to kind of overlook and neglect and you'll come across many further um, misaccusation, misinformation. Um, so, I mean, what, what does all this have, uh, I guess, together, I guess, to tie in? Uh, I guess if we want to talk about how to prevent uh, serial killers from uh, roaming the streets, roaming our communities, uh, let's focus on, I guess, ways of looking at the cause of some of these, uh, the sources where a lot of these, I guess, serial killers come from. Um, and so you can also look at, uh, I guess, Freddy Krueger. I guess you want to look at uh, sci-fi. You want to look at uh, monster shows. Freddy Krueger, his father would whip him uh, in the show, right, uh, until his late teens. Uh, you have also your comic book. Uh, Sabretooth was also very uh, brutalized as a child. His parents would chain him to the wall. Uh, you know, so it's not so much of a, it's going to be a mystery where the source of a lot of this uh, violence comes from. You know, when people talk about, you know, how will... Uh, free market society protect us from serial killers, for example. Well, you know, we stop raising them as such, right? Uh, you stop uh, brutalizing, you stop assaulting them, you stop, uh, I guess, teaching them that violence is a viable solution uh, in society. And while, and how that connects with um, security, you know, you, you have a less amount of, I guess, a propensity of violent offenders, people who uh, have this uh, thirst, um, to hurt other people. Uh, there was a uh, neuro, neuro uh, scientist who was uh, studying this recently in uh, sociopathy and, uh, and psychopathy. His name is uh, James Fallon. Uh, so he's been studying, I guess, the criminal mind for like nearly two decades now. And he came out uh, with an interesting story that I thought it was, uh, was a lot of fun to read in that uh, during his study and, and seeing like uh, the brain patterns of uh, sociopaths and serial killers of the like, uh, he was curious to know whether or not uh, his uh, family exhibited the same patterns uh, because it came to him upon some party that a relative of him was telling him that, you know, his father, I guess he has a long lineage of uh, killers in his family. Uh, his great-grandfather was a murderer and there's a lot of relatives of his that were murderers. And so out of uh, inquisitiveness, uh, he has a brain scan of what, uh, I guess, the areas of like the brain that would highlight uh, a lack of there uh, of different regions um, and found that, of course, his family members didn't have any of a match to that, uh, his siblings, his uh, children, his wife. Um, but he did test himself and found that he himself exhibited the same kind of uh, brain pattern of a sociopath. Uh, this was, well, he took that as uh, kind of alarming. It was, uh, he, that's not something he thought he himself would also uh, exhibit, I guess, those similar traits. 
so therefore he went on to uh, look, study the genes uh, and examining some of these genes that, uh, so for, I mean, this is still a new field. There's still a lot more uh, work that's being done in studying uh, genes, for example, that have uh, predisposed uh, conditions that people will say to violence, you know, to sociopathy, uh, the nature versus nurture debate. And what well, people like to conclude from that saying, well, it's innate that uh, being violent is something natural, you can't stop it. And that kind of uh, commotion is what leads a lot of people to say, therefore, government, right? Uh, you don't know when it's going to come out. You know, it's very unexpected. The source is very unclear. Uh, and then he, of course, found that he also exhibited similar gene traits uh, to sociopathy. Uh, but he made an interesting remark, though, um, concluding his studies in that he feels that there's uh, three ingredients to that. You know, uh, either you have the, the brain pattern and you have the uh, similar genetic markers. Um, but for him, it's like there was an absence of uh, child abuse and violence in his home. Uh, so, you know, there was nothing, uh, I guess, in his environment that was uh, stressful enough to activate those genes, you know, to turn him on. Uh, and as a result of having a stress-free environment, as he would uh, aptly uh, describe to be a very happy home, a uh, very happy family, never had any problems. Uh, but that's a good hypothesis to see, I guess, in the areas of how uh, sociopaths are born or people who have uh, violent tendencies. So no, so already immediately we have a, a good area to kind of focus on to prevent serial killers, right? Peaceful parenting, you know, advocating that which we already align ourselves morally to be against uh, using violence to solve problems uh, and also applying that uh, to children as well, right? Find a plurality of rich creative ways to communicate uh, to, to your child. Uh, so in regards to Halloween season, uh, that, that will be the answer for serial killers. Um, and we're going to go, of course, into how security would be provided, uh, competitive uh, legal uh, dispute systems. Uh, but that's something to kind of take note when we're talking about uh, violent people. You know, there's, uh, there's sometimes there's this fear I've noticed with a lot of people. And media doesn't help with that, of course, when they uh, sensationalize a lot of these things. Uh, and which, like any one of us could therefore be a uh, violent murderous psychopath. Uh, secret Dexter Morgan, uh, and therefore, you know, you can't trust one another. You, um, you know, report everyone directly to the police instead of, you know, inquiring about and, you know, forming a community and getting to know your neighbors. Um, it kind of lends to a very isolationist uh, community, lack of community then. Uh, so that's uh, something to kind of bear in mind. I mean, it's not really a big secret. A lot of this information I found is like it's been around for decades. Uh, many movies, you know, of course, like the ones I listed with Freddy Krueger uh, and comic books, you know, always kind of go back to a source where how were these uh, monsters created and you'll find a long history of child abuse, right? If you ever watched the movie Natural Born Killers, right, even Mickey Rourke had a long history of child abuse. And remember, it doesn't have to be just spanking. This has to be a traumatic experience. You know, the brain is still developing from the time the child is in the womb until the age of four. And uh, the chemical connections just have to be kind of misaligned through that kind of traumatic experience. So it could also be including neglect, sexual abuse, uh, physical abuse, uh, verbal abuse, um, you know, those kinds of uh, harmful interactions with, uh, with children, with people. You know, people are smaller than you. Um, so it shouldn't be that, I guess, you know, mysterious or an enigma to figure out where a lot of this stuff is coming from. There's a great study called the Adverse Childhood uh, Experience uh, that kind of goes over the uh, positive correlation which they found in the number of different types of childhood abuses, childhood trauma, that would have a positive correlation to uh, being susceptible to criminality, uh, addiction, and uh, yep, violent behavior all around. So that takes care, I guess I would say that's a good response to the serial killers uh, question. Uh, in regards to what about warlords, you know, you have to, again, look at how things exist today and you're already living under, you're already living under the rule of multiple warlords, right? If a warlord is someone who uh, violently forces their opinions, their will onto, onto people, onto you and yourself, right? Uh, you know, what are politicians but, you know, local warlords? You know, and this also starts from the local city council level to the, uh, to the governor, to the mayor, to, to state political rulers, congressmen, uh, statesmen, uh, and of course, all the way up to Obama being the uh, top chief political uh, warlord. Uh, so when we talk about without uh, a society, without government, you know, wouldn't warlords take, an o take over? It's like, well, they already have. You know, you're already forced to live under their uh, edicts, under their rule. Uh, so 
that's uh, something which statism does allow, right? Uh, and the same area again with uh, with children and not spanking them. Uh, you're when when a child asks questions about about life, about society, about the world, and sometimes when a parent gets frustrated, they say, "Because I said so. Because I'm your mother. I'm your t I'm your father. Because I'm such and such title. Uh, don't you air, uh, dare uh, be a smart aleck. Uh, you know, don't be a smart ass." And then you know they get popped. And that kind of uh, relationship is what will be exhibited then uh, when they grow up. You know, they won't dare question titles. Uh, they won't dare question uh, authority. They won't dare question uh, government, right? Unless they be shunned by their peers. Um, so, of course, you kind of have to look again, what does exist today and apply those definitions objectively. And objectively, yeah, those are warlords. Those uh, political rulers are very much the same thing that these people are afraid of that currently exists today. Um, so how do you prevent warlords? Well, in the absence of this uh, monopoly on this false security, uh, you'll have, well, again, thousands of uh, competing agencies to provide you security, to provide you uh, real security for your life, for your freedom, and for your property. Um, it's something that uh, you'll find that will finally be consensual, contractual, uh, voluntary, versus the opposite that's uh, cohesive, that's uh, non-contractual, that's... Uh, um, not voluntary and in its very essence. Uh, it's something that you'll have the freedom, you know, if I don't like this service, I don't feel like you're doing a good job, uh, I guess, providing that kind of security. At any time, you can cancel or unsubscribe from the contract or compete entrepreneurially in order to say, you know, again, I can provide a better form of security that's not going to be abusive, neglectful, or harmful to you, the consumer, right? Uh, and instead of being forced to contend with this monopoly of security, you would have thousands of offers to provide you such security, right? I've been in the business for 10 years, you know, look at my uh, long list of, uh, I guess, consumer comments, right? Uh, good reports, you know, five stars out of five stars, you know, give you a guarantee for the first three months. Uh, if you don't like uh, how our service is run, you know, you can cancel um, or, you know, we'll, we'll outcompete our competitor. Um, and that's what you'll find, I guess, when you have when you finally have liberate the free market and providing uh, these kinds of goods and services. As it stands today, that's uh, and you have small segments here and there uh, that readily they do show they do exist, they do work. You know, you have when you go to a nightclub, you have bouncers. You know, but it's their job pretty much to, in terms of security, to prevent assholes, right, uh, from lurking and um, being around an area where people are having fun. Uh, Disney World <laughs> has good security, and your local mall has good security. Uh, you have uh, in areas of like uh, people on Segway machines, of uh, uh, Segways, uh, you know, going about in the mall section, and that's that's offered for free, right? They offer uh, free Wi-Fi. Uh, you know, it used to be before where you have to pay for Wi-Fi going to uh, coffee shops. You know, now people readily, uh, I guess, you know, you're not really a cafe if you don't have Wi-Fi, right? That's a common standard now among businesses. And now malls do too, and they also have security there, and they also um, kind of enforce this, I guess, the normal social norms. Um, and you have uh, the guy in Detroit, for example, uh, Viper Thread Management Security Systems, uh, Dell Brown. Uh, so in Detroit, in an area in which you have, it takes like nearly an hour for police uh, to respond to 911 calls, you have uh, this, this uh, guy who this entrepreneur uh, guy who created his own security company called Viper's Threat Management Systems, and he provides security for many neighborhoods there. Uh, there used to be a, a rash of lots of uh, hijackings, uh, truck hijackings that went on, and he eliminated all that. Um, you know, a lot of bigger companies started hiring his services, and as a result, he was able to uh, use many of those funds uh, to provide free services for impoverished neighborhoods, right? So sometimes people will say, well, you know, it'll be just the rich who will be able to afford security. But, you know, when you have a market, you have a, when you have a free market, you have, you know, a lot of different uh, competitive offers to kind of meet your economic needs. Uh, and you'll also have people who want to do humanitarian aid, right? Uh, like like this gentleman, uh, Del Brown, who's doing in Detroit right now. So he's offering free security to a lot of impoverished neighborhoods that, that can't uh, buy that. Um, so whereas the government prepackages all of security in one package, a free market will kind of provide a lot of niches for different areas of uh, needs to be met, right? In different geography, location, and time. Uh, it's not something that uh, everyone needs, you know, to have the entire package. Maybe sometimes it just needs security at this particular time or escorts. Um, it will be specific. It'll be uh, a lot less costly when you have competition because in regards to like when people say, well, the poor can't afford it. Now let's examine then uh, the poor, how uh, secure, well, I guess the stuff that they can't, uh, I guess, purchase for themselves today, right? Uh, when we're talking about poverty, when we're talking about impoverished areas, 
in which, well, maybe they can't afford security, uh, you know, so who's going to protect them? You know, again, uh, I would say the entrepreneurial minded will find these solutions, but, you know, let's examine the, uh, the things that the poor can um, purchase today, right? So the Census Bureau report had uh, reported that in the, in the United States, uh, people who are considered poor or underneath poverty line, 80.9% can afford cell phones, 58.2% can afford computers, 96% can afford televisions, 97% can afford refrigerators, 96% uh, can afford gas or electric stoves, 93% can have microwaves, 83% uh, have air conditioning. You know, most people think that's like a luxury, right? 82% um, own uh, video recorders or uh, DVD. All right, so I would say that uh, there's definitely a lot of, uh, like, I guess, room and to budget, you know, a couple bucks a month uh, for, for security, right? For at least for a group of people who find themselves obligated, contractually obligated, uh, or have like a vested duty, like this guy Del Brown in uh, Detroit, who feels like I'm here to protect my community, you know, to uh, to actually uh, provide that sense of security uh, that they can uh, live in their life happily and uh, stressful, stress free, right, worry worryless. And so you find already that many of these, uh, even in that remote region in Detroit, that, that people do care about the security of others, and there's uh, people out there who are already trying to provide that. Um, so you wouldn't, of course, be, and of course, you know, you don't see Dell Brown uh, forcing contracts onto people saying, you know, where's my, where's my pay? <laughs> uh, where's my, uh, you know, it's time for you to, you know, your annual uh, duties uh, to pay, you know, your taxes. Uh, you know, the first moment that he does that, you know, competing services would also highlight that effect and, you know, say, hey, go with us instead. Uh, you know, we don't really like the way he's, uh, you know, is treating you, uh, you know, Essentially, you know, they are, they have the ability to go bankrupt uh, in, in a day, right? You look again. I always use Netflix as, a, as an example, but it's, it's a very true. And there's a lot of examples. But of course, like two years ago, when they tried to increase their prices overnight, uh, many people felt uh, cheated. You know, they felt that it was a very sneaky move. You know, they weren't alerted to this. They didn't really receive much, uh, uh, I guess, information or emails on the subject. And out of uh, that anger of feeling kind of betrayed, very quickly they cancel and subscribe, you know, and went to Hulu or other streaming services, right? When you have competition, you have different areas uh, that you can go to. Uh, when government, though, has a monopoly, right, uh, you, you can't go anywhere. Uh, it's criminal and it's outlawed, again, to compete against their monopolies. So that's kind of what you would have. That's kind of how it ex exists today. You know, without government, uh, anyone can compete. Right. There's no permits or licenses to discriminate against the poor from competing. There's no uh, politicians, no uh, monopoly in law to to bribe and lobby your way into creating laws and legislation that uh, forces uh, people to not be able to compete. Right. Entry costs. Um, so absent that, you know, there's a lot of wealth and opportunity then for many of these um, services to be provided. Uh, right now, someone's asking. Uh, Questions. I'll, I'll go over the questions afterwards. I'm just I'm going to get through this real quick, and then uh, we'll go through the fun part. Uh, so when we also talk about uh, government security, in which like they're here to prevent lives or to save lives, uh, again, you know, there's a very uh, common uh, fact that's kind of thrown around a lot there, and it's uh, something to kind of look at soberly. You know, the United States government itself has murdered anywhere between 20 to 30 to 50 million people since World War II. Uh, worldwide governments in the 20th century have uh, murdered over 200 million, right? And in comparison to private crimes, in comparison to that of uh, non-state actors, you know, that is uh, quite a lot. That is, uh, that is an enormous uh, disparity between the two. Um, so, you know, I would say then, you know, that kind of goes back to most people don't really use violence to solve their problems, but, you know, advocating or legitimizing government or in support thereof, that's a system of violence that only knows how to solve problems through violence. So therefore, you'll find a lot of these murders and lack of uh, respect for private property or for the sanctity of life, for example. Um, so going down through uh, to the list of that, um, in regards to uh, what you can do now, um, well, there's <laughs> well, there's there's a lot of stuff you can do now, right? You know. Um, Arming yourself with this kind of information, uh, educating others, passing, uh, uh, I guess, you know, uh, sharing the, the fact that, you know, again, I mean, most people kind of believe that the government here exists to protect your life. That's not true. That's a lie. Uh, and you can cite the Supreme Court cases to, to show otherwise. 
Um, you can uh, start exhibiting the, I guess, social ostracism. I find social ostracism to be the best effective way to kind of deal with would-be sociopaths, would-be warlords, or would-be uh, would um, thieves and murderers uh, as such. You know, where you're going to go if you aggress against a member of your community, you know, if you don't, you know, again, we, we kind of have to step back for a second. So when you have thousands of these uh, free market competing communities, uh, you'll have competing legal systems, you'll have competing security uh, services like golf course communities, for example, have um, you know, the homeowners associations pay for the roads, pay for security. So you'll have that kind of security uh, available. So when people say, well, what do you do about someone who enters that uh, security and, you know, goes on a rampage and kills someone? It's like, well, first I want to know how they got past security, right? Uh, who gave him the passcode to get through the security gate, right? Um, you know, you'll have, uh, I guess you, you kind of have to step backwards and kind of work how it should already be existing in a free market society and having all these uh, preventative measures to keep your life and property safeguarded. Um, so I, I find it very unlikely that would kind of be the case. Uh, that's a lot of wall jumping and fence climbing. Uh, it's uh, something that, of course, uh, would behoove any security uh, minded business to, uh, to look into and to prevent, right? Uh, that's, I would imagine that'd be everyone's concern. And uh, it'll be the entrepreneurs among us, you know, instead of like some of these ideas I'm putting out, there'll be thousands, millions of uh, competing ideas on how best to provide those services, how best to uh, outcompete one another to, to better quality, cheaper uh, uh, costs, right? You know, when you have that kind of competition versus the opposite with the monopoly on this in which you have, again, like Chesterfield County, because uh, that police service is not consumer driven, they have to uh, issue 270 tickets uh, each and every day, each and every day. They have to arrest 90 people each and every day. That's how they measure their standard review performance, right? They're not a consumer driven business, so therefore they can't um, uh, look at it as you would, you know, hey, uh, we're doing well because we have an increase of subscriptions. <laughs> uh, we're doing well because now, uh, you know, we're, we're growing into another facility, we're hiring more employees, uh, there's a great appreciation for our services, you know, the, the credit ratings are coming through, uh, great customer reviews. Uh, and instead, of course, when you don't have that quality depreciates and you have a lot of the um, random uh, amok that's going on right now across the United States. So, uh, and of course, this is something that in terms of security, you also have to remember that the first line of self-defense is you, right? Uh, and of course, arming yourself with this information knowledge is important, but as well, uh, not saying like to go out there and learn Kung Fu or anything like that, where you have to learn how to shoot, but at least uh, take that into account that, uh, you know, when areas of self-defense starts off with self-defense of yourself before that of others and learning how to provide that for yourself, right? Uh, whether that be uh, by getting together and uh, creating a community in your own uh, area and, you know, whenever there's a problem, call us instead, we'll sort it out, but we'll help resolve these disputes instead of relying on the monopoly on police and, uh, you know, wishing the best, you know, that they don't shoot your dog. Um, so I would say it would start there before you start outsourcing or finding alternative means of uh, security. Um, and of course, uh, the best thing you can do is uh, spread anarchy to uh, push out this information out there so a lot of people can uh, get on board with you and um, start creating that, that community of consent. Um, it's something that uh, we do a lot here, I guess, in, in Richmond and uh, continue pursuing that, uh, that area uh, to finally abolish the state and to establish finally a free uh, market society. Um, so I would say that kind of covers uh, a lot of this, and I'll go for the questions and answers now. Um, so let's go from the top. I believe I have uh, the ability to allow you to be on the screen, to be on the video. Um, <laughs> if, if anyone has their, wants to enable their camera and their uh, microphone, just let me know in the chat box and I'll activate that for you if you want to ask uh, any questions directly. Um, while you decide on that, I'm going to go over some of these questions here. Um, so see us here, if a person, if person A hires company A and person B breaks law observed by company A but not company B, who pays for what happens? So I guess uh, person B has their own company. Uh, well, I would say most of these securities will kind of be exclusive to the communities in which they're serving, right? Uh, for example, you can have your competing. So I would, 
uh, presume that for, for the most part, many of these competing legal agencies, competing polycentric legal systems uh, will have the social norm, universal rules of respect for private property, right? You can't really, it wouldn't, can't be really called a free market society if there's no respect for private property, right? What kind of exists today is a disrespect of that, right? They have to first steal your property in order to protect it, right? Uh, they have to rob you of your life's worth, of your valuables, of your wealth. Uh, the things that you cherish first before they can protect it. Uh, so what you'll have uh, in terms of these businesses providing these services, at the very least, they'll have a common rule or law of respect for private property. You know, they'll have um, you know no theft, no assault, no murder, no uh, rape, no uh, fraud. Right? You know, the common five basic ones. Outside of that, I find it to be uh, mostly falling to rules of preferences. You know, you can have your community that uh, you know hates cannabis, right? And great, I will never, you know, if I'm ever visiting, I will never smoke cannabis, right? Unless I'm, because I'm subjective, I agree to the rules before I enter. Uh, here's the consequences of the said rules, you know, do you agree to that? All right, great. Um, and whereas like next door, there can be a, a society with the preference, hey, this is a H2, H2 uh, to a community. Uh, this is a uh, H20 or two, 420 <laughs> uh, community here uh, that kind of caters to that kind of crowd, um, you know, live here and be merry and happy. And uh, so you'll find different uh, protection services that kind of enforce different preferences uh, and according to the rules that you give explicit consent to. Right. And so it's sometimes people will say, well, what about those who kind of break these rules and don't want to uh, follow through with the agreement in the contract that they stated, for example, someone uh, like, like you do this all the time in a way when you go to an apartment complex and sign that contract that says, you know, maybe no smoking on the premises, no cats, dogs are okay, but here are the consequences thereof. And, uh, and do you agree, right? <laughs> if you sign, do you give it your consent to, to these rules? And so you can have the same thing in regards to these free market societies, especially in regards to these preferences. And if someone choose though, chooses, though, to not abide by this contract, uh, that's perfectly fine. That's perfectly fine. Uh, you'll find then, I guess, two things will happen. One would be in the event uh, that you yourself get into a dispute with someone else and are seeking legal services, uh, you know, they'll be quick to point out. It's like, you know, we'd like to help you, but first, you know, you sort of kind of resolve that dispute first, right? Uh, you'll be kind of absence of that kind of uh, voluntary service. Remember, they're voluntary. You know, no one has to give you these uh, areas to kind of provide you uh, dispute resolution services, no more than they don't have to provide you internet or... Uh, water or anything like these are voluntary services um, which kind of go into effect and the second case in which uh, someone repeatedly breaks their contracts uh, well you know that's good information that I'm sure that a lot of people would want to know in order to perhaps mitigate their risk in association with you, you know uh, you seem like the kind of person who continuously breaks their contract breaks their word breaks their bond um, so I don't think that I can really take that risk and doing business with you. No, I'm sorry, I'd love to, but until you start showing improvement, otherwise, you know, go see anger management classes or uh, or, or whatnot. But uh, I'm sorry, I can't provide. Um, I can't risk that. You know, I can't risk that with my patrons. You know, that I'm associating with uh, with a known. You know, so far it looks like you're you're doing a lot of you know thievy, you know, fraudulent stuff here. Uh, until you kind of fix that out, we, we can resume our voluntary consensual relationship. You know, the freedom to disassociate and associate. And so I will find that, you know, it will behoove a lot of people to just kind of follow through with the uh, the arbitrators that they themselves selected, you know. So when you enter a contract, you know, you can choose a, a neutral third party, um, I mean, and any part of person you find to be neutral in terms of resolving these disputes. And you can agree ahead of, of that ahead of time. You can also agree to an appeal process ahead of time. Uh, so you'll have a lot of options in resolving those disputes. And I find that the uh, cost benefit of actually, uh, you know, being honest and following through with your word and such um, you know, outweighs uh, the opposite of a social economic ostracization. Um, so I find that that to be a best way to kind of resolve those disputes. And again, the consequences can, are whatever you agree to, right? So for example, if it's a $200 fine, uh, if it's uh, reparations, if it's uh, um, like the Amish, for example, you know, they know that babies cannot give consent. So they wait until the children of age, uh, of maturity of like, I believe 18, that they can give uh, consent to the rules in that community. And so therefore, uh, knowing that, you know, uh, the only consequences that they have for breaking the rules are social ostracism, right? There's no stockades, there's no fine, there's no imprisonment. Uh, it's just complete social ostracism. So many communities can have different ones. When you break a rule and the consequences is, is a pillow fight, it's wearing a sumo wrestling outfit, it's a Thunderdome. You know, remember, um, 
Barter Town and Mad Max uh, have rules, right? You know, turn in your weapons at the front. You know, no one's allowed to carry weapons coming into this town. Uh, if you are going to initiate aggression against others, that is not prohibited at all, uh, with the exception if you want to take that risk and Thunderdome, right? Two may enter, one may leave. So it's up to you. If you are you sure you want to initiate that aggression? And if that's the case, that's where you, you settle your dispute. Uh, so it's completely voluntary. It's completely consensual. Um, except for, of course, the, the last part in which uh, Mad Max breaks his contract. I would say that'll be the slightest status thing involved in that. And then they force, of course, the consequences onto him, breaking the contract of not killing his opponent in Thunderdome. Um, so you'll have a lot of awesome different ways to kind of resolve these disputes and uh, however you give consent to. But I would say universally, the, the common ones against murder, theft, assault, fraud, um, you know, will be applicable to these agencies, at least to kind of efficiently resolve these disputes quicker. Um, I mean, for example, who wants to uh, hire a dispute resolution organization or a polycentric legal system or uh, <laughs> that doesn't at least respect private property? It's like, ah, oh, that sounds sketchy. It sounds like the like, same thing again with the... Uh, constitution or the government here to provide you security. Um, so let's see, what else do we have here? There will be the basics. Next question mark. So whose laws are enforced, company A or company B? Both are being paid for by one of the two parties, but only one company laws have been broken. So who is right here? Uh, Well, again, that's uh, it, it's determined by the community that that you're in, right? Um, and most people kind of do this when you walk into someone's home. You agree to the social norms upon before entering someone's uh, private property, right? Some people say no shoes allowed. It's like, all right, got it. You know, no shoes on your carpet, uh, and walk around uh, wearing socks. Uh, you know, we have uh, a lot of uh, social norms that kind of um, imply a lot of respect for private property. Um, bathroom etiquette, you know, put the toilet seat down or, uh, you know, don't go into someone's kitchen, just eat their food, right? Um, don't just open up someone's bottle of a whiskey with, you know, without, you know, they say, hey, it's cool, right? Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of rules that people already have, you know, no smoking in my house, no smoking in my car, right? Who enforces that? You know, I guess in that vicinity would be the homeowner and uh, in the vicinity of these like golf course communities or like 55 and age and up older communities that kind of already exist in Florida, it'll be uh, the security that's providing. You know, who provides, who enforces the rules in, uh, at a mall, right? You know, the uh, the mall security. And uh, that's, I would find uh, that to be kind of applicable in those uh, competing uh, societies. You know, there's not going to be one homogenous ANCAP society. There'll, there'll be thousands of different kinds of ANCAP societies. And <laughs> at that point, you know, when the state is abolished, they won't be called ANCAP societies, right? Uh, and no more than we're no longer called abolitionists when uh, uh, that 18th century version of slavery ended. Uh, you know, when the state is abolished, you know, we'll have no need to call ourselves anarchists anymore um, or ANCAPs, uh, whatever they want to call themselves, you know. Uh, so let's see, what other questions do we have? Um, let's see, uh, I think this is a question. On property, let's say for the sake of argument that it's a public area not owned by either person and if you have a few hundred companies all enforcing different laws and working in different ways, you're going to have a more complex network of laws than the U.S. tax code. Uh, okay, again, well, I, I, hopefully I helped uh, answer that uh, that question in, in, in regards to, um, they're kind of similar in that, you know, that the security will enforcing those rules. Like security company A that uh, advocates that enforces no cannabis in this community will not be enforcing that in community B, right? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's not something that they're being contracted for. Um, so I, I want to find that to, to be occurring. So you know, there'll be a lot of efficiency as you find in terms of the market. The market and providing business services is a very complicated place. There is a lot of uh, networking going on. There's a lot of like business owners doing business with other business owners, uh, acquiring their products from hostels, from uh, uh, internet to water services to uh, you know paying, uh, I guess, especially if you have a website, you know, web designers, uh, a logo artist. Uh, there's a lot of complicated stuff that happens in there. Uh, in which the only person who can make the best decision on that, you know, would be the manager, would be the, the owner, um, would be those who 
who can resolve those the efficiency of those uh, of providing these resources to providing those service uh, faster, efficient, right? You know, the, the the government can't do that. You know, they have to go through a bureaucracy. They have to go through a long waiting period. They have to wait, you know, sometime years. Uh, you look at uh, USPS. You know, they're not a business at all. Sometimes they like to claim they're a business. It's kind of funny when they do that. Um, and that's almost like ABC in Virginia likes to claim that they're a business too. You know, we appreciate you know, your service, your you know, uh, your consumerism. It's like, well, you're not a real business. <laughs> it's not like I have any other choice but to go to a monopolized uh, retail store that sells alcohol. Same thing with the post office. You know, the uh, the way that the post office uh, solves long wait lines is by removing their clocks. All right, um, that's not something a real business would would do. They'll you know. They'll allocate the resources efficiently. They'll hire a new employee. They'll, they'll in accordance to how best to to manage that. Uh, governments are not really good with doing that, as uh, I guess USSR has shown in many other socialistic programs, like and uh, Venezuela with a lot of these shortages on toilet paper uh, that's going on. Um, so, and in regards to a public area. Well, I mean, you can have, I mean, you have like designated garden areas, I imagine, in these uh, private communities, like someone who saves a lot of money of investments to kind of create a golf course community. Um, I always, always refer to golf course communities because I think they're interesting. I've, I've been to, I've visited a lot. I don't, I don't know, I don't have any relatives that live in one. I have some uh, some friends that do though, and they love it. It's like their life dream, and, you know, golf course in their backyard. It's, uh, it's great. And so I guess you can say that the golf course area is, uh, well, I guess, accessible for anyone to use, I guess, public use, you know, I guess technically everything's kind of public and private um, in terms of characteristic descriptions, but in terms of uh, the way how government describes public property, um, that's technically not really owned. And if you're talking about an ANCOM society or, um, you know, those can perfectly be, uh, <laughs> be, be, be shown, be, be created, right? If you want to live in a community in which there is uh, not that much respect for private property, in which you share all the communal resources, great. You know, that's a long, as long as it's voluntary and consensual. Um, but if you don't, uh, are particularly enjoying that kind of lifestyle, um, you know, give me a call, <laughs> um, you know, dial in my number at the security gate and I'll help you find a cool ANCAP home, you know. Um, but yeah, you definitely have that in those competing societies. What again, whatever rules you give consent to, whatever uh, uh, agreements that you have that's, that's explicit, right? That's contractual. Whatever goes in, in that, whatever. If as long as it's consensual, right? It doesn't really matter. Um, so it wouldn't. There wouldn't be, I guess, public spaces as you will find it in, uh, as you find it today under government, right? Land that's technically there's no owner. Right. So technically, it's right for homesteading. So there's a lot of opportunities to do that once the state is abolished to kind of try out a lot of these competing communities. We have a lot of space to do that here in the United States. Um, let's see. Uh, how do communities keep DROs and privatized court systems from colluding to shape the public's perception? Perspective on justice. I guess um, I'm trying to understand that uh, question. Are you talking about um, how, how do how do they how would how would they provide? I guess that I mean like a good image of uh, justice or perspective on justice. I mean I think. Inherently, people want justice. People, uh, in a sense, do kind of advocate for property rights. I mean, you look at the you know not so wild, wild west, and there were many contracts that many of these settlers uh, consented to before even venturing out to the, to the to the wild west to you know to, to settle the lands. Uh, to, to like a lot of mining organizations, a lot of cattle organizations. Uh, coming together and having this respect for private property and to these particular rules. What would happen if uh, we broke these rules? And as a result, <laughs> the Wild West was not as violent as you know media or otherwise people would leave you to perceive. Uh, it was like the least <laughs> violent in terms of comparison to like other cities on the eastern coast that were already settled under uh, government. Um, so I imagine they would just kind of follow in the same uh, same way. I think there is a, a natural inclination for justice. Um, there's a natural inclination for, I imagine, for, for people who 
uh, do want to do good, who do, who are moral, um, but are otherwise again tricked under government into being complicit with uh, that violent organization. But for the most part, again, uh, I find uh, that a lot of statistics that people have out there and showing, well, this guy, you know, these particular genders or these particular group of people are not really pro freedom, uh, not to be applicable. Remember, again, they haven't really been introduced to the uh, alternative. Uh, argument against the state. So they're just kind of replaying the same options of, you know, evil or evil, as uh, they were apt to say. Oh, so they're asking how DROs and private courts, uh, well, I mean, that's that's something like I would imagine that most consumers would be uh, concerned about, right? If I move into a apartment complex and, you know, his, his brother owns, is also runs a uh, private illegal, you know, resolves dispute, you know, in terms of a judge, all he does is provides an opinion and being fair and balanced. Um, you know, you can't buy his integrity, so to speak. Uh, otherwise, he's out of business, right? And a lot of competing businesses are looking for, for people like that to screw up, right? They're looking for consumer reports, you know, the magazine to uh, to show that they've, uh, you know, I guess, reneged on their integrity. Uh, so that way they can step up and kind of take their place, right? Uh, you know, the first person who kind of messes up, all the other ones who are going to be quick to rush uh, to take over. And not so much like uh, Google was to uh, Yahoo, uh, and Gmail was to MSN, um, different areas to kind of provide a, a better service. So again, going back to uh, contracts in which you agree to who would resolve this dispute in the event we come across a, a conflict, uh, that will be pre-selected. You get to choose. It's like, well, you know, I don't think that's kind of fair that this is uh, who you would choose, and that's not who I feel comfortable with. Uh, so either you present someone more neutral or I'm going to go and live in that other apartment complex or I'm going somewhere else. Right. It seems like you're running a shady scam here. Right. I don't feel uh, this will guarantee me uh, neutrality. Uh, so that would be something, I guess, as an entrepreneur, they would want to uh, to kind of fix and negotiate and uh, provide that kind of safe of uh, safety of mind. Um, I think that readily most people will kind of look uh, for that as well. Kind of like uh, you're asking the question now, then implies I would say most people would be concerned of that too. And if you want to run a successful business, you kind of cater uh, to meet those demands, to meet those needs. Um, you know, because again, they can cancel and subscribe at any time, right? Uh, they're not beholden to you. Um, and they can go anywhere else, right? They can also compete at any time, right? There's nothing that stops them. There's no, no, nothing that restricts that. Um, so I would say that would kind of prevent such a uh, colluding as uh, what you're mentioning there. Because um, that's what I would choose, right? It's like, well, I don't like the fact that he's uh, that you're related, that you're part of the same company. Uh, reminds me a lot of uh, the old days back when we had a government, right? The police working for the state, the prosecutor, the judge, they're all on the same side. Um, so next question I have, uh, Matt Gillian says, what are your thoughts on contracting yourself into slavery? Slavery? I find that to be impossible. <laughs> um, remember, all these, uh, I, I mean, if you want to uh, contract yourself into some kind of BDSM kinky relationship, I mean, you have a, a, a bondage master and a bondage slave, go for it. You know, have a safe word. Um, as long as it's voluntary and, and consensual, go for it, right? Um, if others, of course, uh, don't want that, you know, that's, uh, that's a free market society. Unfortunately, you're forced to contend with uh, that kind of relationship with, with the government in which there is no safe word um, at all from statism, from the state. And so in terms of uh, voluntary slavery, you can cancel or unsubscribe at any time. You know, I will, <laughs> you'd be hard pressed to find a, uh, uh, a, a legal system, a uh, competing legal system or dispute resolution organization that would uh, evaluate that and say, yes, uh, we're going to take this case. Uh, you did break your contract and you were going to pursue this uh, on behalf of person uh, A's interest. Um, you know, the first person, that's tantamount to like, uh, again, that's a slavery. I think we've kind of removed ourselves past those kind of values. Um, towards freedom of association that can be uh, given at any time, right? The freedom to give and withdraw permission at any time, right? That's that's freedom. And if that's not permissible, then that person is exercising kidnapping, right? Um, so you can leave, you know, said contracts at any time. Uh, no one's, uh, no comp no business is going to enforce that. That's, uh, you know, you'll, you'll go bankrupt. You know, all the other competing businesses will say, hey, this business supports kidnapping. That's what they're uh, enforcing. That's what they're they're saying. They you know, they provide in services. You know, um, voluntary slavery. It's um, 
again, you're, you're in a contract when you have a, you know, when you're contracting yourself into slavery, it's a contract. You can, you can cancel or unsubscribe uh, from such contracts. So it's not really slavery. It's just uh, you prefer to have a submissive relationship. Great. Um, and that uh, at any time you feel it's abusive or harmful or not enjoying it for any reason. And say, yeah, I'm, I'm done. I'm tired. Or, you know, you can leave those set contracts at any time. Um, you know, so that kind of, I guess, pretty much deals with that. I wouldn't consider uh, that to be something that would be <laughs> could, could could ever exist. Um, you know, the uh, the idea of a constitution that's a slavery contract, right? That's a contract with the idea of which uh, one in which you never signed, right? Thirty seven plus people signed it uh, over two hundred years ago. You weren't alive back then. It's a contract in which they force them to the the unborn, you know, to minorities. Um, it's not something that uh, it's great to hear the the Amish, you know, to 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 see otherwise that babies cannot give explicit consent. But the idea of uh, constitutionalists purporting that uh, this is a contract that should be forced onto babies, onto children, right, for your uh, for your progeny, for pros posterity, uh, to bind them, uh, that's very uh, that's like psycho uh, obsessiveness talk, you know, that you get from um, those kinds of relationships. Uh, you can't leave me. Uh, you, you can't divorce me. And uh, now I, I think that's that's so is a lot of concern for those who advocate for the Constitution, because that's essentially what you support, forcing contracts onto babies uh, with the idea that somehow babies can give explicit consent <laughs> to such contracts. That would be uh, that's not even contractual. So that's the I get that I would say that's an evidence or so what a, what it looks like under statism. Um, it is real slavery. You, you can't break free from that. Like Social Security, you're forced to pay for that. You never gave consent when you were a child, when you were a baby. But of course, when it's time for you to collect, when it's time for you to retire, you know, there'll be nothing left for you. Uh, much like the unfunded liabilities in Detroit that has caused many of their monopolized services to collapse and depreciate. Um, so, <laughs> so Matt Gillian says, if I enter into a contract with Jeffrey Tucker that says he gets to punch me if he gives me a shout out on his liberty.me live class tomorrow uh, and he gives me the shout out, what happens if I try to back out afterwards? Uh, I, again, it's kind of the same thing in which, uh, when people, so the way I, I like to define separate uh, violence and aggression, violence will be defined as placing a person in an involuntary position without their consent or choice, i.e. rape, murder, theft, and assault, you know, all violation of personal body self-ownership, right? Um, aggression would be considered like boxing, right? Or uh, MMA kickboxing, or uh, there's also chess boxing. <laughs> and you play a round of chess and then a round of boxing, and then you kind of go back and forth until you see who wins in either uh, areas. Uh, so boxing is an outlet of aggression, right? In boxing, though, there's rules, right? You, you there's nothing below the waist, no ear biting, Mike Tyson, you know, and then we can box, right? Uh, so you can have uh, aggressive sports like that. You can have one in which uh, Tucker gets to punch him. You know, they consent, they agree to the rules. Uh, but like many uh, people who kind of break those contracts, like Mike Tyson, he's penalized uh, from agreeing to those uh, contracts. Uh, you know, if uh, there's there's a prepared uh, I guess penalizing points that happens in a lot of uh, games. You know, people are kicked out. You know, you're not going to be be able to play for the next couple of seasons. Sometimes they can be banned, right? Uh, you don't have a good sportsmanship. Um, again, it seems like you have a reputation of not keeping your your word, right? But again, if it's something playfulness kind of like that, um, I don't think anyone will ever uh, look down at Mike Tyson. You know, when he gets into the ring. Um, and he refuses not to participate. It's like, you know, this is not for me. It's like, all right. <laughs> uh, well, that's, that's good to know. Let's, let's get somebody else in there who wants to, to box, right? Who, who else wants to get hit by Jeffrey Tucker? Um, <laughs> I'll watch that cage match. Um, <laughs> well, I guess I heard uh, Walter Block likes to playing um, chess, or maybe that's Tom Woods and doing like a combination of uh, chess boxing there. Um, so, yeah, it's not uh, something that many... Now, no court system is going to you know, uphold that, right? No more that they're going to uphold, uh, you know, contracts of slavery. So, uh, so that's what you'll find. And again, uh, these are many ideas in which uh, that just kind of list a few, right? It's going to be <laughs> when you when you liberate the, the market, when you end these uh, the state controlled market, you will free up like thousands, thousands of competing ideas and how best to to resolve these disputes, how best to uh, provide that efficiency. 
um, how best to allocate uh, security needs uh, at the, I guess the ones that meets everyone's needs, right? Because um, everyone's needs in terms of security is not going to be the same. You know, there's some people who feel like they just don't need security, right? And at the same time, in regards to um, what about um, other people in regards to, um, I guess one, one common objection people say, well, what about a security company that goes uh, warlord mode, right? You know, that, that's something I would also want to have uh, into consideration. It doesn't seem viable. You know, you would really want to give up this profit making business that you've run so successfully to turn it the other way around and go the opposite direction. Uh, go for it. You know, remember, this is voluntary. At a click of a button, you know, that company can go bankrupt. But even so, you know, you can have contractors or other competing uh, security companies that say, yeah, in the events that, uh, you know, one of them attacks us, let's kind of have a contract uh, alliance uh, against that kind of aggression. Um, and not necessarily means that. Uh, the only people who provide security are uh, security forces, right? It'll be, there's a lot of volunteers who go into that. Uh, I mean, you see like the stuff that were provided, uh, the Ted Bundy Ranch, um, but the Bundy Ranch that's, uh, despite, you know, their advocation for constitutionalism, uh, or believing, um, you know, falsely believing that the constitution, you know, grants you freedom or rights, uh, you find all the time that there's a lot of people who would volunteer to protect others, right? Uh, in, regard, in regards to ISIS, and I guess, uh, overseas, uh, I believe there are like biker gangs uh, in, in Europe who are signing up to go out there and fight ISIS. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, there ha you'll have a lot of volunteers who definitely who want to go against, uh, I guess, that kind of production of evil, those who initiate aggression. Um, and, and again, this is the United States. You have, what, over 200 million, uh, I guess, guns coming around here. There's, uh, let me see if I can find the record for that real quick. Um, yeah, there's an estimate of 250 million guns in the United States. So this is a pretty well-armed uh, region. You know, the uh, Geneva-based Mall Arms Survey uh, that produced a lot of uh, these guns say, like, uh, this population is the most <laughs> well-armed population in the world. Uh, so I find it really hard-pressed for uh, any security company to want to go rogue, right? Uh, the cost-benefit of uh, going the route of violence um, doesn't uh, measure up towards the, the profit making ability of doing things, uh, you know, consensual, contractually, peacefully, right? Uh, who would ever want to contract with such a person when you lose, right? Completely social ostracized. All the other agencies that provide you services to keep your bus business running would also, you know, unsubscribe and stop delivering those services too. Do they really want to be uh, shown, marketed that uh, with by their competitors, like these people associate with that rogue ag agency, you know, don't buy their products, you know, go with us. <laughs> um, we respect your private property. Uh, we respect the sanctity of life. Um, so I, I find it to be hard pressed that that'll be the case. Um, and of course, when, when this happens in the um, in this particular region of the world, all the other, I would imagine all the other uh, state controlled uh, tax farms would want to follow suit, you know, it'll be them that want to liberate uh, their own lives from uh, from that kind of statism in their own community. Uh, whereas so much I focus here in Richmond, most people think, well, what about the world? You know, how are you going to change uh, everyone's minds? It's like, well, let's let's not uh, go too far reaching, right? I'm not interested in changing the world or changing uh, the United States government uh, or even the state of Virginia. I'd, I'd rather focus locally here in Richmond and, and start there within my own interpersonal relationships and encourage them to do the same. Um, and then uh, start from there, right? Um, and then encourage other people to do the same worldwide. Uh, so with that, hopefully this uh, you guys enjoy this episode of uh, Fight the Matrix. And I'll be doing this again next month, uh, every third Wednesday. And uh, I'll provide uh, beforehand information on what topic I'll be introducing. It, so it might be jury, jury nullification. Um, I was in court recently, so um, should be a lot of fun to discuss because I do have some quips and uh, pro and cons about the idea itself and uh, I'll do some work in uh, studying that and uh, sharing my thoughts with that with you. So uh, with that, uh, thank you so much everyone and uh, I'll see you guys at the victory party. Take good care.